Now, in case of uh, peripheral control data transfer scheme, uh, which is also called DMA data transfer scheme, that is direct memory access data transfer scheme, in which the processor is not going to participate and data is directly transferred from a device to another device. Now the device can be a, a peripheral device, the data can be transferred into the peripheral device to the memory or from the memory to the peripheral device or in between two different memory devices. Now this type of <coughs> data transfer scheme, which is known as the DMA data transfer scheme, which is controlled by the device which wants to transfer the data along with one controller that is called DMA controller. And this scheme, as told you earlier, that this scheme is often used in uh, whenever we have to uh, transfer data in the world. And one more important thing is uh, uh, that since the CPU is not taking participate into that because <coughs> in general, in normal circumstance, that uh, any device cannot transfer the data from one place to another place. Uh, because uh, the address bus, data bus, and the control bus are under the control of the uh, processor. So what it has to do, any device who wants direct memory access services, first of all, it will send a request signal, signal in the form of a hold signal to the processor. Please allow us to use data bus, address bus, and the, data, and the control bus. <coughs> so the device which wants to participate in DMA, first of all, it sends a hold signal to the processor. Whenever the processor is going to receive that hold signal, it acknowledges that hold signal by sending an acknowledge signal that is known as HLDA signal, that as well as giving the information to the device that now the data bus, address bus, and control bus are free. You can use it for transferring of the data. From, from any device to and to the rest of the device. So you can say that DMA data transfer scheme is a faster scheme as compared to the program data transfer scheme. And uh, as I told you that it is, uh, it will be using, uh, this DMA data transfer scheme is being used just because of whenever we have to transfer the data. Now, as far as the DMA data transfer schemes are concerned, it is uh, of two types. One is called uh, burst mode and another is called cycle stealing technique. So these are the two techniques in which this DMA data transfer scheme is being used. So first of all, we have to know that what is the burst mode and what is the cycle stealing technique. Now, <clears throat> burst mode of DMA data transfer scheme is a kind of a data transfer scheme in which the input output devices withdraw the DMA request only after all the data bytes have been transferred. And it is called burst mode of the data transfer. By this technique, a block of the data is transferred, and this technique is employed by uh, magnetic disk drive. In case of magnetic disk data transfer, uh, you cannot stop or you cannot slow down without the loss of the data. So uh, this type of scheme is going to uh, transfer the data in the bulk, as a, that is called the block transfer. Second one is cycle stealing technique. <clears throat> in this technique, uh, a long block of the data, whenever it is transferred, uh, it is transferred uh, to a sequence of DMA cycles. So in this method, after transferring one byte or several bytes of the input-output devices, we draw the DMA request. So this method reduces the interference uh, in the CPU activities. And this interference can be eliminated completely by designing an uh, interfacing circuit 
which can steal bus cycle or DMA data transfer only when CPU is not using the system bus. So, meaning thereby, in case of burst mode, whenever a request is granted to the device, it will transfer the data, block of the data to the destination. But in cycle stealing process, what happens whenever the CPU, then whenever the processor is not using address bus, data bus, and the control bus, in that particular moment of time, the request of the if devices are being uh, entertained for DMA data transfer. So that is why <clears throat> it is called cycle stealing technique in which some of the time in which the processor remains ideal, only that time is stolen and that cycle at that, that time is utilized for the DMA data transfer. In DMA data transfer uh, scheme, uh, the input output devices control the data transfer and hence the input output devices must have in a requirement of the registers to store the memory address as well as how many data bytes has to be transferred for that it has to store the count register. So it also must have an electronic circuit to generate the control signal which is required for the DMA operation. So usually the input output devices don't have these facility to, to, so to solve this kind of the problem. A DMA controller, uh, who's, uh, which is designed by Intel itself, uh, with the chip number 8257 or 8257, it is being developed and it is being used for, uh, and it will be helping the input output devices or the peripheral devices to do the DMA data transfer. So. <clears throat> This is uh, about general introduction of the DMA data transfer scheme. Now, <coughs> interrupt driven data transfer. Now, what is, uh, before we go to explain uh, interrupt data transfer, interrupt driven data transfer, let us understand what is uh, the meaning of interrupt and how it is being entertained by the processor. The interrupt Input output is a process of data transfer where an external device or a peripheral device can inform the processor that it is ready for communication and it requests its attention. So the process of the process is initiated by an external device and normally it is asynchronous. Why it is asynchronous? Asynchronous means that it can be initiated at any time without any reference of the system clock. However, the response of the interrupt request is directed or you can say it is controlled by the microsystem. Now, the interrupt requests are normally classified in two parts. One is called maskable interrupt, another is called non-maskable. Now, 8085 microprocessor has four maskable interrupts and one non-maskable interrupt. So among all the four uh, maskable interrupts, one is non-vectored, which is which requires external hardware to supply the call location to restart the execution. And other three are the vectored for uh, to the certain specific location uh, in the network. Now, the microprocessor can ignore or it can delay a maskable interrupt request if it is performing some critical task. However, it has to respond to a non-maskable request immediately. So, there are many ways by which the maskable interrupts can be avoided. Now, the maskable interrupt, you can take an example of a telephone. If the telephone is ringing, your mobile is ringing, it may be possible that you may attend it, you may not attend it. But if it is ringing and it is a very important number to which it is ringing, you have to take it. In that case, that is called non-maskable. You cannot avoid it. But rest of the phone, you can avoid. So this is the difference. This is the analogy in between the maskable interrupt and the non-maskable. Non-maskable, the microprocessor cannot avoid and it has to handle it. It has to go and execute 
uh, the information which is which is coming from the device who is going to interrupt the microprocessor to the non master but those devices who are interrupting the microprocessor operation through non maskable interrupt can be delayed can be avoided by the processor as uh, whether it is free or not now the interrupt process uh, it is going to allow the microprocessor to respond to those external requests which is coming from the external devices or the peripheral devices and the attention is required because service uh, it has to provide the service on the demand basis and leaves the microprocessor free to perform the other tasks otherwise on the other hand in case of pooled or in case of a status check input output the microprocessor remains in the loop does nothing until the device is ready to transfer to so this is one of the important way by which uh, through the interrupt any device can uh, interrupt can transfer the data now <clears throat> in interrupt driven data transfer scheme the microprocessor initiates and uh, an input output devices to get ready first and then it is going to execute its main program instead of remaining in the program loop to check whether what is the status of the input and output device when input and output device becomes ready to transfer the data it is going to send a signal to the processor to a special input line that is called the interrupt line so you can say that the device is going to interrupt the normal uh, processing sequence of the microprocessor on receiving an interrupt request the microprocessor completes its current instruction whatever it is executing what is in its hand and then it is going to attend the input output device so before it is going to attend the input output device it is going to save the content of the program counter on the stack first then it takes up the the subroutine that is called interrupt service subroutine because the purpose of interrupting uh, by external device to the processor is to transfer the data and the transfer of the data will be possible only by executing certain certain set of instruction and these certain instructions are already stored in memory by the designer so that <clears throat> and that memory you can call it as a the instead of instruction which is stored in the memory you can call it as a subroutine so that subroutine which serves the purpose of interrupting and providing the services of data transfer is called interrupt service subroutine this iss stand for interrupt service subroutine and in this interrupt service subroutine there will be certain program which is written which is being executed and while it is being executing then only the data transfer use happen without executing any instruction you cannot transfer the data so whenever a microprocessor is receiving any interrupt signal from the, the peripheral device it first stores its content of the next program counter into the stack and then it is going to take up the interrupt service subroutine which is written for that particular line to which the device has interrupted and once it takes up the interrupt service routine then it is executes it and data is being transferred and after the data is being transferred it will the uh, microprocessor will return to its main program how it will return to the main program because the program counter next instructions address which is it was in the program counter it is stored in the stack that will be taken back by the processor to resume its execution so while using this interrupt driven data transfer scheme the microprocessor time is not wasted in waiting in the previous scheme you have seen that every time my microprocessor is going to check whether the data is ready or not whether the data is ready with the input output devices or the peripheral devices or not 
in that particular case microprocessor is not in the waiting state it will be doing its own work whatever is assigned to it and meanwhile when the data becomes ready at the peripheral device it sends an interrupt signal whatever it is executing it will stop save the program counter and it will execute the interrupt service subroutine which is meant for that particular device now we can take an example of interrupt driven data transfer to the ad converter so this figure shows that the interfacing of an ad converter to transfer the data employing by employing the interrupt driven data transfer so the microprocessor sends first the start of the conversion process the signal that is s by c to the ad converter and thereafter the microprocessor executes its main program which it it is not keep itself in the waiting state it, it continues its program executing the main program since ad converter is a slow device as compared to the microprocessor it will take some time to convert the analog signal into uh, equivalent digital uh, information and when the ad converter is going to complete the task of the uh, conversion from analog to digital it makes an end of <coughs> conversion signal that is end of c e of c uh, in the form of it and the signal is going to come high and this line is connected with the interrupt uh, line of the microprocessor now this ec line since it is connected to the interrupt line of the microprocessor so when this interrupt line goes high the microprocessor takes all the necessary steps which was explained earlier for transferring of the data from the ad converter to the processor and after completing the data transfer the microprocessor returns back to execute its main program that it was executing prior to the interrupt so this is how the interrupt driven data transfer is being works then we have uh, multiple interrupts it is possible <coughs> and several input output device can interrupt the processor so in in a microcomputer system there since there are several there are many input output devices and all these input output devices can use interrupt driven data transfer scheme so while interfacing this input output device using the interrupt the there, there are certain situation it may arise the first situation may be the microprocessor may have only one interrupt level and several input output devices are required to be connected to that this is the first instance that there may be a single line and there are many devices who wants to use the interrupt driven data transfer scheme to transfer the data the second case may be the microprocessor may have several interrupt lines and one input output device is connected to the each interrupt there are multiple lines and each device is attached to the individual lines now the first one is an example of 5086 and the second one is an example of 5085 the third one is there are many lines which are available and there are many devices which which, are, which is which are required to be connected to when it is single line and many devices means there are only one line which is available in the microprocessor and there are many devices which are connected to the microprocessor who wants to do the interrupt driven data transfer there are multiple lines in in case of 8085 we have five lines that is prior rst 7.5 6.5 5.5 as well as int int so there are multiple lines and suppose there are five devices so individual devices can be connected to the if there are five lines and there are 10 devices which want to be which want to work as interrupt driven data transfer scheme then in that case there may be more than one devices which has to be connected with the many uh, individual lines so the first scheme is there are several input output devices which are connected to the single interrupt line so how it is possible it is possible to the logical or there are many devices we put an or or gate circuit and all these devices are connected to that and the output of the or gate circuit is connected with the single interrupt line of the microprocessor so if any device out of uh, which are connected and the input side of the or gate 
when any device is going to interrupt the microprocessor, the microprocessor has to ascertain which device has created an interrupt because there are many devices and by uh, knowing the property of the OR gate, if any one of the device is going to give high signal, the output will be high. So what it has to do, microprocessor wants to know that which device has given the interrupt signal. So it has to check each device one by one. So whenever it is in this process, it is going to do this process that it is going to check which device has interrupted. This process is called device pooling. Because once it receives the interrupt signal, it is required to know that which device has sent the uh, interrupt signal. So that process is called device pooling. And it may be possible that more than one device is going to interrupt at a time. And it can be, it can happen because if more than one device has interrupted and made their line high, the output will be high. So in that case, microprocessor has to set priority and then it pulls on that priority. If we have five uh, uh, lines on the input side of the OR gate and five devices are connected to that, so what microprocessor has to do, and suppose three devices has interrupted at the same time. So microprocessor has to set priority that which input line will have the priority. And based on that priority, it is going to check that which line has interrupted and entertained. Now this system is slow because every time it has to do the device pulling and it is also time to, since it is at slow, so it is time to change. And for device pooling, uh, we have two types of device pooling. One is called software pooling and another is called hardware. What is software and the hardware interrupts, we will discuss in the coming slides. So uh, this is the case when several input output devices are connected to the several, uh, single input. Now the second case is when one device is connected to each input. So, when a microprocessor has several interrupt levels, when the microprocessor has several interrupt levels and individual uh, devices are connected with the individual lines, then in that case, microprocessor is going to immediately know that which device has interrupted. And the, process, the processor going is automatically going to transfer the control to the specific memory location, which is assigned for that particular interrupt. Such an interrupt scheme is called vectored interrupt. In previous case, we have no a, a new new uh, word has been introduced that is pooling, that is device pooling. In this case, we have vectored interrupt. We will discuss it later on. Now, when more than one device is connected to each level, there are many levels and, and each level has many devices connected to it. So, when a device is going to interrupt the microprocessor, it knows the interrupt level, which interrupt level has interrupted. But then, since many devices are connected to that, so it has to use pooling technique to find the device in that level. So, what will happen? It uses pooling as well as vectored interrupt scheme. Both these schemes are being used in this particular case. Now, <clears throat> these are the, this is the schematic or you can say illustration of uh, different interrupts which are used uh, for 8085. As we know that in 8085, we have five interrupts, namely trap, RST 7.5, RST 6.5, RST 5.5, and IFT. And we also know that RAP has the highest priority. And we also know that RAP is a non maskable interrupt, and the rest of the interrupts are maskable. So the priority has been assigned. RAP is having highest priority, then 7.5, then 6.5, then 5.5, and INTR has the lowest priority. When the interrupts <coughs> are to be used, they are enabled by, by instruction. 
they are enabled by instruction that instruction is called interrupt enable instruction and the mnemonics of interrupt enable instruction is ei which means enable interrupt so while writing the program whenever we want to enable the interrupt we have to use the instruction ei in the main program now this particular diagram uh, is showing the interrupts different interrupts of 8084 the instruction ei as i told you the instruction ei is going to set the interrupt enable flip flop to enable the interrupt and the use of the instruction ei enables all the interrupts whether it is intr or 7.5 6.5 7.5 .5, all the interrupts are enabled and there is another instruction which is used to disable the interrupt is known as the mnemonics of that is di which is used to disable the interrupt and once we have used disable interrupt instruction within the instruction no device can interrupt the non maskable uh, sorry maskable interrupt only mas non maskable interrupt can be will be entertained otherwise rest of the interrupts cannot be entertained so it means whenever 8085 as to is in requirement of interruption which allows the interruption if and only if, if i use ei instruction with the program and once ei instruction is executed it will enable all the lines and through those lines whatever devices are connected can interrupt but once we have used disable interrupt instruction within the program and it is being executed it is going to disable all the maskable interrupts it means any device which are connected to these four lines cannot interrupt the operation of 8085 now it may be possible in certain situation it may be desired to prevent the occurrence of the interrupts when a particular task is being performed by the microprocessor and that is why disable interrupt will be and disable interrupt is going to reset as enable interrupt is going to set the interrupt enable flip flop disable interrupt is going to reset the interrupt enable flip flop but the trap which is a non maskable interrupt is the exceptional case it is always high priority it is always on and any device which is connected to that trap line can interrupt the processor whether interrupt is enabled or it is disabled enabling and disabling of the interrupt will happen only with the maskable interrupts not with the not maskable interrupts now what happens when an interrupt line is going to high the processor completes its current instruction saves the program and counter into the stack and at that time it also resets the interrupt enable flip flop before it is going to execute the interrupt service subroutine so that any other device cannot further interrupt meaning thereby once the 8085 enable entertains one of the device to interrupt the data transfer scheme to transfer the data it disables the interrupt enable flip flop so that rest of the while executing the interrupt service subroutine of that device or that line no other device can make the interrupt except trap so once a device is entertained to transfer the data to the interrupt 8085 automatically disables the interrupt and once all the data transfer operation is over it automatically enables the interrupt so that now other devices can interrupt now the resetting of the flip flop can be done by three ways first is by software instruction that is pi second one is resetting the system if you if you press the reset button it means it's called the system reset or third case may be after recognition of an interrupt so there are three ways by which uh, in uh, interrupts can be disabled first is by using di instruction 
it will disable all the interrupt. Second one is the reset, press, press reset button is going to disable. And third one is once a microprocessor is handling the interrupt request of a device, it automatically disables the interrupt. Now, before the program returns back from the after the execution of the interrupt service routine to the main program, all the interrupts are enabled again, and and this can be done with the help of using the instruction EI in the ISS before using the instruction RE. So whenever it is executing a subroutine. Subroutine, the last instruction of the subroutine will be the return. And before the return instruction is executed, one of the content of the instruction which will be written is enable the interrupt, whose purpose that it is going to finish the data transfer operation. So once it is going to finish the data transfer operation, it will allow the interrupt enable flip flop to enable itself so that any other device can interrupt it. So what happens uh, in many occasions, the the user or the programmer may want to prevent the occurrence of uh, several interrupts while microprocessor is performing certain tasks. And this uh, can be done by masking off those interrupts which are not required to occur while certain tasks is being performed. Now, the interrupt which can be masked are called maskable interrupt as uh, explained earlier. And the masking of those interrupts uh, uh, can be done with the help of the instruction. And it's, so by writing a program, you can mask the interrupt. Now, as I told you that we have two categories, maskable and non-maskable, and I've already, already explained that trap is a non-maskable interrupt, which cannot be masked, which has to be entertained, but rest of the interrupts, RST 7.5, 6.5, 5.5, and INDR, all these are the maskable. 